welcome everyone to this, the third uh, seminar in our Nature Inspired Urbanism series. Um, I'm Stephen Marshall, uh, uh, I'm kind of the leader of the, the series. I'm delighted to welcome today uh, Claire Narroway, who's on the team, and uh, Philip Matas Glover over here. So we have actually have some recording equipment by popular demand. People kept asking, are you going to record it? Are you going to record it? So, so we thought, well, well, we'll give it a go and see, see how it goes. Um, just before I introduce our speaker, just one or two words about our series. So it's called Nature Inspired Urbanism. Uh, it is to, the purpose is to explore the biological and ecological knowledge applied to understanding urbanism. Urbanism broadly defined, it might include uh, not just physical design, but also other urban processes. Um, via analogies and metaphors, modeling, experiments, and more. And we're going to hear about some of these modeling and experiments um, in the course of the series and perhaps even today. Uh, so we, we call it urbanism. The focus is on urban design and, and perhaps planning and urbanism and so on. But we're also open to learning from nature-inspired design in architecture and engineering. So that's not our core. Uh, our core focus isn't on um, sort of biomimetic architecture and so on, but however, there's a lot to be learned from uh, those aspects, bionic engineering, biomimetic architecture, zoomorphic architecture and so on. So we, we're open to learning from those as and when uh, we can. Just a word about our sponsor. So actually, uh, this, this project is called the, the Self-Organising Built Environment, and it is funded by an inspiration grant from the Centre for Nature Inspired Engineering, which in, in UCL, which is in turn uh, funded by the EPSRC. So it's a, it's a kind of it's part of a larger program, a kind of hard-headed engineering nature crossover uh, project. Um, and we have a short uh, shortage project running uh, until the end of March called the Self-Organising Built Environment. Um, and we have a monthly seminar series, um, and I will tell you at the end about the future seminars, uh, one of which incidentally is on Wednesday, so please look out for that one, uh, Animal Cities by Scott Turner. Same time, same place. Um, but, um, and in this series, uh, the talk, we, we invite our speakers to talk for about 45 minutes, um, and then there's plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Doesn't mean we're going to last all the time up to seven o'clock. Although I think it's fair to say that in the previous occasions it has lasted uh, till around that time with the discussion and so on. So there's plenty of time for discussion at the end. So finally, to our speaker, uh, very uh, proud to welcome uh, Claudia Pasquero, uh, Pasquero, who is uh, at the Bar School of Architecture at UCL and also the Ecologic Studio. She's an architect, author, educator, co-founder and director of Ecologic Studio, uh, and also director of the Urban Morphogenesis Lab here, or just over the road, in the Barton School of Architecture, UCL. And you've done various work to do with not just the architecture side, but also how cities uh, grow, and uh, urbanism, and self-organization, and all those things. So we're very excited to uh, and your talk is the polycephalon on the origin of the inhuman city. So we're all uh, very intrigued to learn about what you're going to tell us today. So I'd like to hand over to yourself. Thanks for the invite. So my work operates at the convergence of disciplines such as uh, biology, computation, and urban design. I'm particularly interested in looking at cities for material organization. And if we look at some of the contemporary cities from the top, we might realize that it's difficult to depict uh, the difference in, 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 in nature between what are natural patterns and what can be considered artificial patterns. So in a way, I'm interested in looking at the city from what they define a non-anthropocentric point of view, and from this, the inhuman city of the title. Uh, realizing that in our contemporary global world, it is, it is impossible to trace a clear distinction between natural and artificial, uh, between landscape and city, and, and ultimately between the natural biosphere and what they call the urban sphere. To, to work 
work into this framework, we, we, we like to work from the macro scale to the micro scale. From the cycle I view that allow us to overcome the traditional description of the city as, as walls and landscape to and, and rather look at the city as a set of ways, as a set of information and fields, fields of water, fields of bacteria. To the micro scale, and the idea that this is the Fizari call center, from which we can uh, borrow model of, of organization of the city that we, uh, in particular in this case, the Fizari call center model of collective intelligence. From this perspective, the macro and the micro, uh, city and the morphology are mostly defined by flow of matter, information, and energy that fuel the root away. So cities are not anymore full and void, as we've been uh, taught um, in the past, but are defined by a set of flows. Uh, in, in urban design and in urban planning, many are, are, are discussing the fact that global cities are becoming as, a, an attraction point, a center where the global population is moving to. But these cities are not isolated points, are connected by flow of matter, information, and energy. So flow of goods, flow of energy, flow of information, like social media. And this uh, flow, uh, and they define this flow, the urban sphere. So a sort of sphere that brought the world over and somehow dialogue with the natural biosphere. We all need mines, power stations to support the increasing metabolism of the global city, but these, uh, these, um, these systems are somehow living in contradiction with the natural biosphere. So can we reconceive the urban sphere as a co-evolutionary system of the natural biosphere? So in the lab in UCL, we've been looking at the, at the Fizarium polysephalon and the slime mold as, as, a, as a possible is a possible model. So the, the physiology of polycephalon is a unicellular organism. So how can a unicellular organism be the model for a city? What the scientists discovered, or scientists have been calling the physiology of polycephalon uh, next biological computer, have been discovering that is able to optimize network and redistribute resources. So some of the tasks that the turban system are, are, are need to perform at all time. But the way that the Fizarium and Polycephalon perform this is different from our from, from the system of master planning. So it's not through top-down engineering and planning, but it's through bottom-up collective intelligence and distributed spatial memory. So the, the, the single cell of the Fizarium Polycephalon is composed of millions of cells that interact between each other and with the surrounding environment. And through this continuous interaction and exchange information, of information are able to redistribute energy and networks. So we try to see how the slime mode could become not only a biomimetic model, but actually a tool to design and, and interact with this collective intelligence in real time. Um, many of the papers that exist on, on slime mode, they look at, at, at the at the relationship between slime mode and city, but for me, they look at, at, they frame the question to demonstrate how the slime mode is clever. What we wanted to do is not that. We wanted to start from the finding of science and try to develop an apparatus that will enable us to develop design through slime mode. So, uh, we designed a set of apparatus here, which will show just one, in which we input information from the satellite to the slime mode through three printing technique and, and other and, and to 3D printer technique, to 3D printers to stratum and uh, matrix of LED light. Um, through this set of information we are able to influence the slime mode and read in real time the pattern the, the slime mode through information from the satellite and then read in real time what are um, the patterns that emerge uh, that would in turn influence our goal. So we set up a set of speculation on how uh, the slime mode could influence the emergence of, of projects. So how can we apply this modern design mod model as a real-time project of collective intelligence? So from the observation of the slime mode and the setup of this apparatus, we, set, we develop also a set of projects that instead look at uh, the slime mode more as a model and then 
try to expand it to different units. The biocement project looked into the possibility to harness local resources, such as water, wind, and sand, and evolved the Urban Society Ferry of Lima Oasis in the United Arab Emirates. It is a research project that focuses on geomorphology transformation. This trend inspired Biosimens Lab to take local resources such as sand and algae to produce cancellated sand called biosimens. The lab proposes it as a local material for self-construction in river oasis. Research begins with analog and digital simulation experiment. The first category is exploring the relation between binder deposition parameters and dunes morphologies. Synthesized sand dunes were introduced in the second digital simulation, and geomorphology information extract from the site were also import to the second analog experiment in order to specify the analog and digital simulation. Wind parameters were introduced in the next category, the same as the last simulation category. It starts by digital simulation based on abstract parameters and set up wind tunnel to provide single direction wind for the physical analog. Wind's influence towards sand dunes were further explored by tracing the movement of sand dunes on the site of labor. The analog experiment using color mark record the process of sand dunes morphology transformation. Moreover, intrusion phenomenon by wind inspired the next simulation of the fabric exploration. Digital simulation explains the process of intrusion on abstract sand-based material. 3D print technology is the main application method that combined all the basic elements from previous explorations. Digital model was built upon sand dunes morphologies. Two part that from the digital model is translated into the UR robot. The model is built by printing binder on sand layer by layer. Next, we introduce a drone as the territorial machine prototype, including drones with a function of sensor the territory, connection between drone and end effector, and so on. The urban protocol that based on the territorial machine is composed with two aspects, flying pattern and injection pattern. Firstly, the drone will fly as drones to sensor the terrain and choose the wind warm area to inject binders. The binders will flow down along the sand dune slopes. Besides, drones can also get a data map of sand dune boundary and wind distribution on site. During the injection, binders concentration area will influence by the wind distribution. Another part of the urban protocol that based on the interactive website is also composed with two aspects, voting or joining the construction area. Finally, according to the fish pond location within the site, drones fly in 500 meters square to sensor the terrain and inject binder. Then the binder flow along the sand dune slopes To show the more specific structure, we ran the detailed simulation on the sample site that had been chosen. Using the three injection method and reconstructing the detailed part of the territorial morphology. So, this type of project look at collective intelligence and, and look at how we can imagine on one side to work with elements that are present on the territory, in this case a specific bacteria or chanobacteria that is the result of the wastewater um, system in the oasis where the water gets used uh, four times, and the four times is so saturated of these chanobacteria that it cannot be used anymore. So uh, how can we reduce this type of specific element that is a waste from the territory? And the student in that case discovered that there is a research in UCL that tried to use this nanobacteria for biocementation or actually for the formation of calcareous structure for bones. So how can we transpose that to urban design? They made a set of materials test and at the same time they imagine a, a series of machines that will operate this biocementation. But they are not machines that go to the site and build the site all at once. But they are imagined as a set of machines that could live on the site, could become the equivalent of some of the natural phenomena that are already present in, in the sun, like the, the particle of the sand or, or the wind. 
So to expand on this aspect of material, material that are present on the cities, we have this other sort of line of project that look at elements of waste and try to understand how they can... Microbiocide use project, project is a material-oriented bioecological urban design research. It aims to propose a long-term urban waste recycle strategy and reorganize the urban landscape network. In the first chapter, this project across London as a research object and used data manipulation methodology to analyze urban issues. There are three steps, collection, integration, and illustration. Raw data is collected and then integrated into an Excel document and finally illustrated into maps by digital tools. Then we choose microbiocellulose, which is a kind of self-growing and biodegradable fiber. Research begins from material experiment. The first step is to produce microbial cellulose in the lab. It's a fermentation process. Bacteria will convert sugar into cellulose. After four days, it grows a layer of thin film in the liquid. The next is organic waste experiment, which use purple cabbage instead of sugar to cultivate cellulose, and also we tried pineapple and kiwi. This experiment proves that organic waste can be used to produce microbial cellulose. This is ester vector excellent, which can create pure cellulose material. The third step is to engineer the bacteria to produce cellulose with different characteristics. The second chapter is to build the material system. The biggest challenge is how to build a 3D structure from this soft thin film. Considering its property, there are two points. It should be hard, and it should be able to memory the shape. The material system explores four techniques to achieve self-supporting system. The first technique is dehydration. According to the experiment, microbial cellulose can become hard by dehydration. So we develop the second technique, staging. We use knots to control the wrinkled behavior of cellulose and form patterns. Then, in order to get a precise shape, this project explored to use robot arm to fold a 3D unit by a piece of cellulose. However, because of the property, the robot arm only work on paper. So we fold it manually and start to combine them together. However, the structure is still small. Therefore, we develop stretching technique. We design the mold and put cellulose film on it. Cellulose film will shrink when it's dried and keep the shape of the mold finally. By stretching technique, this project can build any shape and any size with microbial cellulose film. In the last chapter, the project developed the material system into a bigger structure and built an urban prototype. The functions can be urban landscape, emergency food farm, and material factory. And then we developed the structure form according to the human spatial demands. We group the people into the old, adult, children, and also have three special groups, homeless people, street artists, and peddlers. This interface helps people to choose what prototype and what place to build. Finally, this project proposed a self-proliferated community, which is an urban waste digestive organ system. Most importantly, community morphology growth is a dynamic process. All communities can use waste to produce cellulose, and then the material can be used to build the next structure. With time, the waste is digested and the community grows bigger, influencing the environment and the people's behaviors with the use of different spatial prototypes. In the future, this community will become a real-time feedback that the microorganisms give to the city. some of the projects we've been developing with the students in the lab and there is a continuous feedback between the lab and my work in ecology studio and in particular both the work on microorganisms and remetabolization and the work on selective intelligence has been tested in real projects in the office or some are real projects, some are speculative projects commissioned by galleries and exhibitions. So the first uh, series that I will present is a series that started in 2006 and uh, ran to 2016. So it's the Eco Machine series. Eco Machine proposes a more adaptive, local, and distributed mechanism of interaction.
interaction between the urban sphere and the natural biosphere. The urban prototype will support the communication between the various systems, such as social, infrastructural, architecture, and environment. So probably the most well-known of our eco machine is the one that deals with microalgae and the cultivation of microalgae. I will go back 10 years for a second. And uh, the first prototype was developed for the London Architectural Biennale 2006 and then presented at the Venice Architectural Biennale 2006. This prototype was, at the beginning, although later the series became about the integration of urban algae farming in the city, was about, uh, for us, material computation or how microalgae or macroalgae will be able to index or visualize parameters in the city, such as, for example, the, the absorption of pollution or CO2 and the presence of solar radiation. So what we did was very simple. We primed a set of uh, what, what was a sort of screen built up with a recycle bottle with, um, with, with algae. And for us, the way the gradient of the algae would evolve would be a, a manifestation of parameter that we can compute digitally, but for us it became interesting how well, these can be embedded in architectural system and communicate parameters that we are not able to visualize, like the presence of CO2, for example, in the city. So this first installation was simply about the creation of this gradient that correspond to the presence of the CO2 and the solar radiation and develop photosynthesis, but also gradient on color and bubbling through the prototype. Uh, fast forward five years, um, we work. Uh, we, were com we, we did various prototypes. This, this, uh, this specific of the eco machine that deals with microalgae was very popular. We did few prototypes in, I think, at least one per year. And um, then in 2010, 2011, we were commissioned a master plan in uh, Sweden in the Oyster region in Simmersham. Uh, the Baltic Sea, you might not know, is one of the most eutrophied sea in Europe uh, for different reasons, because of the boat, the both touristic and the oil tanker that cross it, but also because it's got an exchange of water, a complete exchange of water every 20 years. So because of this reason, the fishing industry is going down and there has been an algae bloom, so the first one of the first effects of, of the eutrophication of the sea. So the, the Sweden had, a, a, had a, a grant from the European community to develop a prototype that would try and deal with this algae farming. So what we did, we, we mapped different types of microalgae that are present in the territory and we tried to associate them with both prototypes that were existing on the territory, like disuse farming or abandoned fishing infrastructure, but as well with possible economy that could emerge that have to do with energy, food, or pharmaceutical industry, mainly. So we created a map and a set of prototypes like a farming network, a micro tower, a filtering garden, that are sort of architectural urban prototype, but at the same time deal with a specific type of micro microalgae present on the territory. To present the project, we, we develop a map that allows people to travel on the territory and visit these different type of uh, ponds, water bodies, and sea coast that, and, and visualize this algae. But at the same time, we, we, we work on a sort of one-to-one -one, uh, installation that enable us to materially visualize um, this microalgae, uh, this different type of microalgae. So this installation was then brought to London to the Architectural Association, and uh, in this picture from the, from the Architectural Association. Uh, where we work with 10 types of different microalgae and each microalgae was, was different in color and each of the microalgae was, uh, could be used for something different. Uh, what, one of the worst, probably crit more harsh critique that we got on the project is, yeah, is an uh, algae garden or an algae farm, not yet a farm because in this one we are not farming in reality, is an algae garden but, well, is maybe a little bit over aestheticized. Well, for me, the fact that it's aestheticized, I don't know if it's over aestheticized, but we discuss the aesthetic of production and of microalgae is part of the equation. Because aesthetic is not about making something pretty, but aesthetic is also a philosophy of communication. So how do we establish a different uh, level of communication between 
the capability of production in the city and, 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 and the, the single user or a multitude, a multitude of users that could interact between themselves. So we, we, we prime again the, 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 this uh, ivy garden with a set of uh, uh, bacteria, microalgae that are affected by bacteria. And then we ask people to interact, provide CO2. And, uh, um, and of course, there was the interaction with the solar radiation. And also, people were asked why they, they provide CO2 and, and um, uh, to the microalgae free the oxygen that will make the algae suffocate. We are also asked to scan this uh, QR code that enabled them to go in a microscopic uh, image of, of, of the algae. And read what can you do with a specific algae, where, where it's coming from, what is the color. In the moment that people scan the QR code, we are able to uh, register their, their location. So there is this dialogue between the digital simulation that simulates the potential growth and change of color of this microalgae and what visually we see in the room. So there is this continuous feedback between the digital and the physical aspect of the, uh, the garden. Uh, this series then went on. We did other prototypes that speculate on uh, possible spatial organization. So this prototype cultivates simply um, chlorella, which is um, a microalga that is often consumed as food, as part of, or considered a superfood. And so this one uh, speculates on a photobioreactor, which is a column, that at the same time is able to passively harvest uh, the chlorella, so it becomes a farming. So from a, from an early garden, in this case, become a farming system that uh, is able to harvest the chlorella at the bottom of the photobioreactor. Uh, fast forward other few years, then we arrive at the 2016. Uh, now, the, the one, the late, one of the latest version is now part of a collection in the ZKDA Museum. Um, was pre presented in dialogue with the Metafoli. Uh, the Metafoli is another prototype, we call it Metafoli, Metafoli for the Metropolitan uh, Landscape. And in this case, is again a prototype that deals with material behavior and collective intelligence. And now, can you establish different type of dialogue between material behavior and spatial organization in user. In this case, um, the metaphor is constituted by six hub. Uh, each of the hub has got a specific um, intelligence and is able to trigger up to 300 heads of buzzer. So when a user walks around the folly um, or is inside the folly, is able to interact with the specific point and um, trigger these uh, Case of other that create the sound, the sound depends on the morphology of the tile, and if more than one user is present, a negotiation needs to emerge. by the uh, way clicker produce sound by moving um, this fiber within itself and the fact that clickers of different dimension emit different sound was reflected in the, the specific element that depending from the length would emit a different uh, way of sound. The old structural morphology is integrated with the set of information that in this case are not about microalgae or organic material but are bits but for us somehow um, is always about integrating the morphology, the spatial organization with flow, as I said before, of matter, information, and energy. In this case, it's not the flow of information. And this is uh, these are the sensitive points. And now the structure is articulated um, as being fabricated. We can control some of the parameters remotely through an atlas, but that's it. And in that particular exhibition, there was a sort of interaction between the metafoly and, and, and 
the new version of Orthus. In this case, we try to expand Orthus mor morphologically. We create this cloud, uh, which is again a photobioreactor, but <coughs> expand the aspect of spatial organization or can you create spatial organization through uh, infrastructure and the infrastructure of, of production. This type of project then went somehow to another level when we were invited by Expo Milano 2015 to develop an outdoor pavilion that could integrate microalgae, in this case spirulina. Uh, spirulina is considered a superfood. Microalgae are uh, 
bacteria and, they could, and when they get integrated in urban context is not the question whether they get contaminated, it's when and how. So they get contaminated for sure, but the research that these scientists had and they, the reason why they commissioned this open air photobiograph was that they wanted to, dis to, to test different type of ecology of chlorella that would be positive of ecology and would still allow the chlorella to be consumed as food but at the same time to be more resilient in, in public space. So at the same time, this became a way of communicating with the local population and trying to create a bridge between the scientific research and the urban context. That's why we developed further the interface and uh, that, is, that, that is still online now and that has got data on the cultivation, on, on, on the characteristic of the fall in the day, of the healthiness of the algae and, and on what, how much has been produced. Uh, so this is uh, about this series of ecosystems, but somehow lately we've been expanding on another series in which I just one project about that series, which is the morphogenetic urban landscape. For us, the series of ecosystems started by tackling the urban scale of how can we, through a single prototype or a distributed set of prototypes in the city that really describe the way we produce, could treat their different dynamics in the city. But as a project in the office, somehow we got a little bit objectified and became more of a monkey. <coughs> so we tried to, to re expand from the urban scale in the office. And this is a project we've been uh, commissioned from Montenegro. Um, is uh, uh, Salina, uh, it's a salt extraction area uh, which. Uh, was abandoned uh, 10 years ago, so it's, they don't extract salt anymore. And now there is a little bit of a, we are seeing from the satellite, because for this project we established a collaboration with the European Space Agency to map the dynamic of the Salina. So basically there is a bit of a conflict at the moment, because on one side uh, there is a developer from Saudi Arabia that would like to erase what exists in the Salina at the moment and, and develop a high-end risky stick development. On the other, there are ecologists that want to preserve the new biotope of the Salina. Basically, the Salina became a sort of an ontological part because of the fishes that were there and the type of element that are present in the territory. And so is somehow, somehow there is a name of protecting this new biotope, but how do you protect this biotope and create a relationship with the development? The sentinella is right now above us, uh, scanning the landscape of the Salina in Mussini and sending data to the ground station in Matera. The sentinella too has got a a wide range of sensors that are able to capture different wavelengths. Uh, interestingly enough, you can uh, algorithmically select uh, different wavelengths and, and, and calculate or compute uh, a series of, of drawings or maps that uh, may allow you to see this landscape and, and the gradients and, that are characterizing it. Is this the way birds see the landscape? Thank you. 
be interesting to imagine how this can be embodied in architecture in the form of this uh, uh, aviary uh, that are open because they don't have a net but that create conditions for nesting and for interaction beyond what we know today. As you look at the antagonistas of salt right now, you can imagine uh, these patterns to be affected by these emerging morphologies. Yes, and perhaps this whole process can be detected from the satellite itself. So basically what we did in histology is trying to create relationship between multiple systems which are the bird migration pattern, the land and the water system. Uh, there is still no social system basically present in the salina because although there is an interest from the local population to preserve the salina, this interest is uh, for us a little bit ideological because there is no activity going on in the salina. So how can we create, start creating a set of activities that would uh, transform this sort of ideological love for the salina in a different <coughs> understanding? So we mapped again the presence of salo bacteria to the satellite. We, we, did experimental biosimulation also in the Salina. And we started to speculate on how we could use the current water dynamic and the presence of the cyanobacteria to create new type of landscape. More anthropogenic landscape, so more constructed type of landscape that could host, start to host cultural activity, some of the activity that the, 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 the government wanted to have is a museum of the Salina or touristic activity. So, and we imagine this type of machine again that don't go, they're not machines that are construction, <coughs> but they are machines that live on the site and transform the mechanical machines that are already present in the site in a new type of uh, biodigital machine. Uh, uh, this interface so shows. This, this <coughs> machine and then the voice of this. Robots work uh, yeah. according to the growth of flying bots. Each so. robot represents a large amount of robots in real territory and they will be able to constitute the complex networks similar to Simon's. So, the idea was how can we transform the landscape by creating moments of overpopulation, moments of hardness that could start to host different types of activities. So we, we work on, on, on how this machine could behave responding to, to the element that we have been mapping, but we also try to test how effectively this 3D printing could happen through on-site machine, and this is um, Enrico Dini, uh, we have been working with him on, on the idea of 3D printing on-site, this uh, Italian engineer has been working also with Foster and on the idea of sending this machine onto the moon to 3D print, and so we work with him on with this type of biological binder, right, which is more fragile than the chemical binder that is usual, uh, usually used, but still is able to use local sand and local bacteria to um, start to, as I said before, harden the landscape and produce uh, morphologies. These are some of the morphological speculation of the landscape. And then the other element that we wanted to connect to is this migra migratory pattern of birds that are somehow a global resource and transform the, the Salina. In, in, in that sense, the Salina is part of a global network of researchers that look at how birds migrate to the two different continents. But how can we create infrastructure that are able to host the birds, but as well human activities? So we work with the, with an, uh, with the ornithologists analyzing the, the different uh, pattern of behavior of the birds. And we started to visualize them again through this idea of uh, 3D printing. This is in, 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 in the aim of, again, corrugating the landscape for the sake of human activity, but also for the sake of birds. At the moment, as I said before, there is this law for the Salina, but uh, on the other end, the, the birds, when they go there, they, most of the time, they are subject to poaching or killing because there is no human activity going in there. The Salina is all flat. So there is an idea of preserving something, but that something is, is, is you can't preserve it as it is. It's just degenerating. So how do you create different modes of interaction through architectural systems? So these are some of the um, speculation of possible prototypes that could be manufactured. And uh, of course, uh, 
this at the moment is, is, is a speculative project, but I think in a case as complicated as the Salina is, um, it, it was the first step in opening up the debate between conservation and development. And uh, at the moment, the government is raising our funding to uh, develop a first morphology of a museum on the site that the first prototype, again, could host some of the research that the ornithology are carrying on, but as well attract possible international attention on the project. And I think I can finish here for today. I think I might stop five minutes. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have, um, uh, we've got um, plenty of time now for uh, any discussion, so I'd like to welcome <coughs> questions from the floor. What you were just talking about, uh, when you said you were working on sources to actually map out where the birds are spending their time, was that information you were using to work out on the site itself where the birds were spending their time, whether there were there any kind of... Well, there is a bird that's actually on the line that they are using, which of course doesn't track all the birds, mm -hmm. it track a certain amount of birds for each species, because, and then from the data that they have, you can run simulation and approximate the behavior of different types of birds. That's a um, Maybe I'll just ask a question there. So, I mean, how, I mean, how, what would you say were the main sort of lessons for herbalism mm -hmm. that you learned from this, the nature, the different aspects of the nature of the sea? What were the main lessons? So think you got my Well, uh, what I'm interested in is, uh, and I always say, is like uh, something I don't, I didn't know in this lecture. It's like uh, somehow reconsidering uh, the introduction of all material processes and material computing. In How can we trigger collective intelligence? But as a collective intelligence, as a, as a sort of form of reaction. So for me, that is, that is particularly interesting. And, and when I think about that, for me, one of the possibility is to reintroduce, reintroduce pattern of production. The time of people to react to that. No? So if you think about the, some of the discovery of uh, Freyol, for example, on material computing, no? they were used, they, for me, they're really interesting, but somehow they were used in a uh, sort of still scientific part. What if you interpret them for the possible knowledge that they can transmit in terms of uh, the capability of people of reading pattern when you reintroduce production in the city and when you make this pattern more clear? And when you say collective intelligence, I mean, can you maybe expand on that? I mean, yeah. how, does it, I mean, does it relate to uh, uh, like distributed? Decision making, or how does it relate to decision making? In the well, city, the, for me, for example, if you take um, the way we uh, recycle nowadays, uh, of course, each of us can decide to recycle, but we need to take the apple and put it in the brown bag. We are no possibility of seeing the process of recycling. We have no possibility of developing a creative take on it, okay? So in that way, we can all recycle, but it's a tick box, okay? What if in that action, there could be a different type of intelligence that could trigger network to emerge? If I grew up in a farm, and uh, in that farm, there was a lot of recycling going on. But it was not about recycling, it was about the capability of reading processes that we have lost because I think we are consuming our object. We are not dealing with processes anymore. We, we, we get the energy comes with a switch. Okay? The, pro, the, the food comes as a product. Everything is objectified. We are not able to read process and predict pattern and therefore interact. I make another example. If you look at the clouds, in a place where you are sort of a castle with a reasonable uh, guess, you, you are able to say, oh, it's going to rain or it's not going to rain, right? But to predict the cloud, you will need, you know, wind speed, incidence of the radiation amount of humidity. But still, we are able to read the pattern. 
are some of the few patterns that are still difficult to read. Many of the patterns are so, if we're not able to read them because they are so hidden from us, that we can't interact with them. We can't develop in Bayesian terms a meta understanding. We can read about, but that's different from being able to interact. If I read something, I have a logical understanding, but I don't develop this type of interaction. And for me, it is essential to become creative and trigger different types of behavior. For me, there is no point in changing from uh, uh, more renewable resources to a less renewable resources. Well, there is a little point. But the point is in harvesting the capability of a collective intelligence of human beings to actually take more conscious, not in the way of I've been reading about and I need to feel better and I need to do something, but in the capability of developing new type of behavior because I know, because I read what is surrounding me. So, so if you are, sorry to keep going, but yeah, sorry. just to pursue this point. So if you were, say, mayor of London, right? Yeah. You know, what, what would your, you know, what would be the outcome of this research in terms of integrating or exploiting somehow collective intelligence and recycling you mentioned in food distribution or food production and whatever. I mean, what would they, you know, what, well, what, what would they, what would they that, do? that actually is uh, treated, uh, well, there are different aspects. Like there is one aspect that in London I think is treated in a very rudimental manner, which is air quality. So we are not able to visualize it. So nobody interacts with it. So there could be implants. There could be sensors. There could be augmented plants. There could be different things that are able to trigger. I'm not talking Sorry, about did you say nature. Augmented plants. Yeah. Could you just explain what well, you mean? I know. I, well, I was talking with one of these. Uh, uh, researcher, I didn't do research on that. I was just uh, talking in a, in, a, in a dinner with one of the researchers uh, in the Institute of Nanotechnology in Braga, and he was discussing these these type of plants that are that are changed at the level of the nanoparticles and could be able to, when they photosynthesize, manifest the fact that they are absorbing certain types of pollutants or the color of the gradient of the leaves. You would be able to visualize certain aspects of the city. That's what happens. Okay. There is this trait of research, but I believe in well, that's right. It sounds, I, know, sounds I know that exists. Yeah, it sounds, it's also very interesting to hear all these kind of futuristic kind of ideas. So, but I'd like to open up to more questions from the floor. project with the sand patterns. Yeah. Uh, I know you're tracking the sand movement, but what was the final outcome of that tracking? So basically the idea was, uh, uh, I was saying before, we were working with a specific uh, specific bacteria that's produced by cementation, but then if you want to work with it on the desert, how do you work with it? So the student made first a set of test or with the sand from the desert and the bacteria to say how uh, consolidated the structure can be. And then some of the other tests that you were seeing were tests about the morphology that would emerge. <coughs> Which type of morphology would emerge? How do we inject it? You can have an injector of different kinds. And depending on the injector, you get a different type of morphology. So do you percolate from the top of the dune and then it goes down? Do you <coughs> inject at the center of the dune and when the wind arrives, be modified. So all these tests were on one side to test the type of morphology that could emerge from this injection of bacteria and consolidation of the sand. And on the other, the interaction with the local environment, like the wind, for example. Because um, uh, in the desert, there are two types of uh, original urban settlement. One is the one with the tent that we uh, probably many you know from movies and stuff, even if you're not in there. And the other are uh, buildings that are mainly made with sand and uh, use uh, uh, dead corals as stone. The fact is that the wind in this desert, the Rubalkan desert, is so strong in summer uh, that every three years these this, this buildings are completely eroded away and need to be almost totally rebuilt. So the idea was why don't we work with the wind as a force? So the physical simulation and digital simulation of the student were trying to speculate on the fact that, okay, 
these drones, in that case, will lean on the territory, keep injecting, we monitor the wind, the wind will erode a little bit, but it's part of the game. We can accept that there is erosion and reinjection, erosion and reinjection, and the morphology somehow keep evolving. So we don't try to bring back the building to an original square where it doesn't want to stay because of the condition of the site. We work with a morphology that is more embedded both with our material system that with the milieu in which it is, which is the wind and the specific site. So these were the simulations. Um, the story you presented um, offer a future which seems to suggest it's um, more of a collective experience mm. rather than a governmental organisation. Um, do you feel that that's a, a, a change to perhaps the structure which is around at the moment? And do you see the part of introducing these technologies will be a sort of change in perhaps the opinion of the system which is in charge at the present. Mm -hmm. You mean how do you actualize it for <laughs> Well, um, that, uh, I think I'm very far from that at the moment, but uh, how do, I, do you actualize it politically? It's still no. My step is to work uh, with the municipality and try to organize it in a specific place, that places like this Montenegro project or the project we are doing uh, in Denmark. Uh, there, are, uh, there are elements to be understood, uh, I think, in the way you deconstruct production, of course, because uh, uh, many of the prototypes that we do, although they are embedded in, a, in, a public, in the public realm, they are more discussing the value of, of introducing pro production than really introducing production as a mechanism. Like, for example, I thought various times that the inter in the interface of the urban alifoli we should introduce the value of the micro -island. Because we have a garden that will take care of the of the of, of the prototype, but you can but the micro aggregate can be very expensive, so just five hundred grams can cost five hundred euros. So the idea is that if you would add value, maybe you would trigger, you know, the interest of the population to take care of it for a certain amount of time, etc., and shift something in that direction. But I didn't specifically work on that at the moment. I'll come in with a, a quick, another quick question. Um, so I, I seem to recall um, uh, learn, uh, hearing about slime molds in a way, yeah. about how they have a, I mean, putting very broadly speaking, how certain kinds has a, has a capacity to be at one stage individual, a series of individuals, mm -hmm. and at another stage to sort of come together into a single kind of unit. Yeah. I seem to remember. Uh, um, uh, in fact, we had Charles Jenks here many months ago talking about, I think, around the period of the architecture of the Chucky universe and all that stuff. And I think he seems, I seem to remember he mentioned slime balls, which is where it's buried somewhere in the back of my mind. Anyway, but I think, I think he was using that as a sort of metaphor. And, and, uh, and of course, oh, oh, well, okay, so, so I, so basically, okay, so I'd like to invite you to, to comment then on... What, what, what interests me in the apparatus of the slime model is really just one project, but we have various projects of that in which we try to interact in real time with slime model. Yeah. Well, that is also pedagogical interest in a way, because uh, um, of course there are algorithms that can describe slime model. But what interests me is the interaction of real, in real time with computation. The city is able to compute. So how do you interact with computation in real time? Uh, because in a way, if you describe slime mode, you can describe it through an algorithm, which is accurate enough, I, I computer the real computer. But on the other hand, a slime mode can be described algorithmically, can be described poetically, can be described in many ways, and they're all field of culture. But there is a difference for me from interacting from a description of something that interacting in real time. With, with material behavior. So with the, with the student who do all these 
material computing model and we try to interact with them in real time and con connect we augment them by connecting them to our drawing and sensing them and recording and printing because I'm interested in setting up apparatus or mechanisms to interact in real time with behaviors, material behaviors. That can be material behavior of the slime mold at the same scale, but at another could be material behavior in the city. So that's my idea. I mean, I think, I think what I was guessing at is that it could be on one level, it could be a, a, some metaphor about I don't like metaphor, but I know, yeah. Okay, maybe you don't, maybe you don't, but what I'm just trying to say is. Can be a model. Yeah, I know, but what I'm. Making models, yeah. also metaphor. Well, I was going to ask you, what I was just going to say was that I think it could be possible for some people, not you, mm -hmm. but other yeah. people, to yeah. use the slime mold as some kind of a metaphor for a city Everything or a society yeah. and people coming together. Yeah. Um, and that's one way of using it, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying you're using that way. Yeah. But then you could use it as a physical model. Yeah, it's a behavioral model. You can do a, a you can do a geometric model. Yeah. Okay, so a geometric model of 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 a building is not a building. It's a geometric model of a building. Yeah. Right. But you can have a behavioral model of a city, and then discuss uh, an analog behavior. You you can have an analog geometry, and we are used to discuss that. But you can have an analog behavior. So it's just deciding which type of model you work with. If I draw, sorry. Yeah. If I draw this, right? Yeah. If I draw this, yeah. what is this? Well, wow. <laughs> it's George. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a representation of something we might recognize yeah. as a pitched roof yes. house, yeah. but it's not. It's a square with two lines on top, right? Yeah. So it's a geometry. So we could. The, the, the idea, this is especially good to students. Yeah. So it's, it's the idea that you can decide to work with geometrical model, with behavioral model, with model that have to do with geometry and behavior at the same time, like the one of the same, and, and decide which okay. direction you want to go. Okay, so, um, so we'll last so a bit of this long question, yeah. or extended question. Um, so, and sorry to go back to Jenks again, but in his metaphor, let's say, yeah. he would be saying that the people, people are like the parts of the slime mold that come together as a community or not, I assume. Mm -hmm. Like the analog or the model, yeah. what you wish to call it, there's an analog between people in human society and parts of uh, the slime mold or the behavior of the slime mold. So I guess my question to you is, what is the analog or what is the model? What is what exactly is the slime mold or its process or its algorithm in nature? What is it modeling? What are the well, corresponding, in, in, in the parts, the corresponding well, parts? In the, in the, the apparatus that we use, uh, yeah. in particular, we were using, we were, the, the drawing that you saw there was a, a copper mining area in right. uh, Arizona okay. with different type of minerals. The color that we were importing from the food source were the different type of minerals. And the idea was to imagine a set of machines that will redistribute these resources and keep excavating the site because the site was going to be abandoned in a few years. How do you redistribute the resources and keep excavating the site so that it becomes more of a landscape than an infrastructure? So the slime mold was an analog of redistribution okay. of resources because what the slime mold does is optimizing resource distribution, as far as I know from the paper I've been reading. Okay. So, the analog is redistribution of resources. And the uh, 3D printing of the food source were the origin of the resources. The color would index, because the slime mold when, when, when moves, the, the cell when they move transport color. So you can recognize the original resource from the color that is transported. The LED light were obstacle, so analog of obstacle, because the slime mold avoid okay. light. So okay. And yeah, we had a set of elements that could translate element from the side into information. Okay, so so that, thanks for that. Um, so any more questions from the floor? Yes. So I'm just interested um, when you talk about your spirulina and algae experiments. How are you? Are you interested in using those? Um, putting them into buildings to produce cleaner air from buildings? Or are you interested in incorporating them into cities? 
Well, well, one aspect of this project developed, and there are other aspects mm. that could be developed from my project, is the integration in the yield environment of algae farming. And uh, in the interest that, uh, that uh, as I said before, production can be embedded and visualized, so if you are able to read the gradient of color of algae that emerge, you're able to know that you can have more production or less production, and there are element of the city that you can harvest. So yeah, the idea is to embed it uh, in, in, the, in the architectural system, in the material system of architecture. But more like facade system or actual structure and develop it from there, actually build buildings instead of only pavilions because they're a small scale, so they're probably easier as well structurally to solve, but um, well, uh, the, the high the rise city is not structural so much because the, the, the complication is not structural. The complication is biological at the moment, I think. If anybody that works with uh, microalgae, even harm, if you ask them, if they are honest, they will tell you that the complication is biological. Because the indoor prototype that we have, although there are some exhibition, I think they work. Actually, I'm sure they work. Because the, the indoor, you can have some level of contamination while you're in a controlled environment. In terms of temperature fluctuation and a lot of other parameters. Outdoor, the, the mix of microalgae that you have, the development in biology that you have at the moment is still a little bit delicate. So uh, that is the main obstacle, I think, mm -hmm. in everything properly integrated into the building. And, um, as architect, the only things that we can provide is a test bed. And of course, there are aspects also of, of aesthetic, and you can decide to, to, if you find a client, and everybody is looking for clients, you can decide to integrate it in the building more as a garden than as a farming. So you try not to harvest as much as possible, but you tune it towards you know, the aesthetic capability, like when you have a green facade for, you know, it absorbs CO2, it does a lot of other things, maybe you don't, you need to work maximum production of microalgae, but you need to work more so the idea of this embedded uh, by a digital landscape and garden in the city that can create shading when the algae grows, that can absorb CO2, and of course that, that I think is something that is doable. To have really high level production, I think is still a little bit uh, uh, complicated from the development mainly into the biology of the microalgae. And uh, would you like to just mention briefly, or you know, mention your some key publications? Because I know you've written about uh, cities. Uh, like it, cities as a biological computer. That's all. Yeah. And also a, a book on uh, self-organizing. Uh, systemic architecture. Yeah, that's, uh, we also have an um, article from my. Yeah, I have an article in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Systemic architecture of the operating manual for the self organizing city. Uh, it's almost operating about manual for the self organizing, organizing city. city. Yeah, it's almost about that. Yeah, so, we, because we've got this self organizing as a keyword yeah. in our project. So yeah, because the, the, the idea of, of that book was working in between environment, machine, and behavior. And probably behavior is what we are trying to develop now. I mean, the idea that you have this larger scale system and this smaller prototype that eventually should trigger self organization. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, 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 the paper I was talking about, that's in Architectural Research Portland? Yes. Um, recently. Yeah, there is a specific number of synthetic biology at the city, yeah. which is created by Rachel Armstrong from oh, yes. the University. And, and uh, was he wrote right? an article a couple of months ago. Of, so yeah. it's, it's a current recent Yeah, 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 this is a couple of months So ago. this is cutting edge stuff. Yeah, there is also an article that I recently wrote, it's called Design Prototype and Discuss more the um, the the algae series and now each prototype for us is a way of uh, doing research and developing a new piece of the of the prototype which is, was uh, in a conference in, in the lab uh, yeah. about research uh, uh, research and uh, and practice relationship. Okay, thank, thanks for that. So I'll just is there any final questions? Uh, before we uh, draw to a close. Um, so if we can thank you very much for your... Uh,
last uh, couple of slides. So, so basically, this Wednesday, on the 14th of December, here, in here, at 5 o'clock, um, uh, we have Scott Turner, we're delighted to, to uh, say he's, he's coming over from the State University of New York at Syracuse, Syracuse. Um, and he is a co-investigator in our project, so we're delighted to have him over. And the top, his topic is called Animal Cities. Um, we might suspect that he might be talking about some particular kinds of animals in there, maybe even homo sapiens, maybe ter termites. Um, so please do uh, come along if you're interested, and please do sign up if you're, uh, if you're hoping to come along. Um, and then one other one is to, to just to announce the detail. Uh, is, is called What is Nature in Biomental Strategies? So this is a slightly more philosophical talk um, by, by uh, Bernadette Benson uh, from uh, uh, Paris and Sorbonne. So that's 18th of January 2017. There's an Eventbrite um, page set, set up for, for that one that you can uh, get to. So basically, if you're interested in attending, um, you can go into our uh, well. You can go into our, our website um, and go into the, the blog part of the website, which has links to the event like pages where you can then sign up. You can also follow us on Twitter. Um, you can try email me. A lot of moment I've got uh, a backlog of emails to be honest. Um, but please do keep in contact one way or another. You can contact us via the website as well. So we always notice those uh, those emails. Um, and, and then we have another one or two. Elsa uh, is, uh, is talking uh, about um, ants and self-organizing settlements in February. And then we have a kind of final um, uh, lecture from, or, or workshop rather, from, from the new project whole uh, in March. So that's future things. So keep in touch. Um, keep a look out via the website or Twitter or other announcements for things going on. And uh, thank you for your attention.